In this video, we'll look at what happens when you bring supply and demand together uh, to find equilibrium, which is going to be how price and the quantity produced in a market is going to be determined. So a reminder then, first of all, that we have our downward sloping demand curve, uh, which shows the relationship between price and quantity demanded. So as price rises, um, the quantity demanded is going to fall because goods are going to be less affordable for consumers. And then we have our upward sloping supply curve, uh, which has the opposite relationship. As price rises, producers are incentivized to increase their quantity supplied, giving us that upward sloping shape. And for the first time here, we can put the, those two together onto one diagram, uh, and that will give us this equilibrium point here where supply is equal to demand. So that will be our market equilibrium at this price P and this quantity Q. But I think it's also important to think about why we actually arrive at that equilibrium point. And this diagram here outlines that quite nicely. So again, we've got the equilibrium point here, price P and quantity Q. But we can think about well, what's going to happen if the price was higher than that equilibrium point. So at this higher price, the, the quantity supplied is higher than the quantity demanded. And so that means that we've got a surplus. So quantity supplied higher than quantity demanded. There's too much of that product available in that market at that going price. And so this would be a situation maybe like the end of a season where a shop's got leftover stocks of a product. Um, they're going to look to try and sell off that surplus. And so that's going to put downward pressure on prices. And at the same time, the lower prices are going to incentivize more consumers to come into the market and increase their quantity demanded. And it's going to push us back towards that equilibrium point. And a similar thing is going to happen if the price was below that equilibrium point. Um, at this price here, below the equilibrium, there's a higher quantity demanded than the quantity supplied. And so that means that we've got a shortage and if you've got a shortage for a product, that's going to put upward pressure on prices. And that upward pressure on prices is going to mean that the quantity demanded is going to fall because of that inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. And so what that means is that if we've ever got a situation where we're sort of away from this equilibrium, then we're constantly going to be pushed back towards the equilibrium by the market forces. And so we refer to that as the, as the point where the market clears, where supply is equal to demand, and that's our equilibrium market price and quantity. But as the conditions in the market changes, the market equilibrium is going to change as well. And so a reminder here that we've got these factors that are going to cause demand to change and these factors that are going to cause supply to change. And so if we were to have, for example, an increase in consumers income, then we've seen before that, that is going to shift the demand curve to the right. So consumers have more income, demand increases, and it shifts to the right. And you can see on this diagram here, that will give us a new equilibrium point. So our original equilibrium is at this point here, P and Q with our original supply and demand curves, demand shifts to the right. And if the price stayed at this same level P, then what we'd find is we'd find we'd have that situation of a shortage demand, the quantity demanded would be higher than the quantity supplied. And so that will push the market price up to this level here and we'll reach a new equilibrium, at a higher price P1 and a higher quantity Q1. On the other side of that, if, for example, a product was to move out of fashion and that would uh, cause the demand to decrease, the demand curve in that case would shift to the left and that will bring us to a new equilibrium point um, further to the left here, at price P1, quantity Q1, so we've got a lower price and a lower quantity than our original market equilibrium. Moving on to the factors that will affect supply, you might have then, for example, an improvement in technology. And you've got your initial market equilibrium here. Improvement in technology is going to increase supply because suppliers are going to incentivize to be incentivized to produce more at any given market price. And so that's going to shift your supply curve to the right. And so the increase in supply shifts the supply curve to the right. And again, you'll move to this new market equilibrium at price P1, quantity Q1. So the price decreases this time and the quantity increases. 
And then finally, if we have another factor affecting supply, maybe costs of production were to increase, well, that would lead to a decrease in supply and your supply curve would shift to the left. And again, we get the new equilibrium point, which is going to move this time to a higher price and a lower quantity. So price P1, quantity Q1 would be our new equilibrium point. So it's really, really important that you can analyse these changes in these terms. What happens when demand shifts? What happens when supply shifts? And label your diagrams. Um, it doesn't matter exactly what you label them, P, P1, P1, P2, but then you can refer to um, the movement along the price axes and the movement along the quantity axes in those terms in your analysis. While these supply and demand diagrams are showing the situation in a particular individual market, it is important to be aware that these markets don't exist completely independently of one another. So we have situations where a change in one market is going to impact on another related market. So some examples of this, you might have goods which are in competitive demand, which we've seen before with taxis and buses. So if, for example, we had an increase in the price of buses, then that's going to increase demand for taxis because more people are going to want to travel by taxi instead of bus because of the higher price of buses. You might also have goods which are in joint demand. So these are our complementary products where you might have an increase in the price of games consoles and that's going to lead to a reduction in the demand for the controllers because fewer people are buying the consoles, so fewer people want to buy the controllers to go with them. Now derived demand is where the demand is not for the good itself but for what it actually produces, the output it generates. So a couple of examples of that might be um, the demand for flights and for air transport. You don't demand air transport for the fun of flying around. Um, you demand it to get to your location, to where you want to go. Um, in a similar way, firms don't demand workers and their labour because they enjoy their company and having them around. They demand them because they produce output for that firm. And so in that situation, if you had an increase in demand, for example, for houses, then you'd have an increase in demand for construction workers as well. If you had an increase in demand for holidays at a certain location, then the demand for flights to that location would increase as well. And finally, we've got composite demand. And this is where you've got a good that's demanded for multiple different uses. So maybe think about uh, you've got milk, which is one good, which is demanded for its own use, but it's also demanded to produce cheese, yogurt, butter as well. And so if you would have an increase in demand in any of these individual markets, then that would have a knock on impact an increase in the demand for milk as well in order to produce those products. And markets can be interrelated on the supply side as well. And so you might have joint supply, which is where a firm produces more than one product together. And so we've got the example of wool and lamb. And so if the price of lamb was to go up, incentivizing uh, suppliers to increase their quantity supplied of that, then as a side effect, you get an increase in the supply of wool as well. And the other side to that is you might have products in competitive supply is where you've got firms which can use their factors of production to produce alternative different products and they can either produce one or the other. So again, we had the example of strawberries or raspberries. And if we were to have an increase in the price of strawberries, that incentivizes the farmers to produce more strawberries. And so the supply of raspberries as a response to that is going to reduce because they're using that space to make the strawberries instead.